do COVID-19 vaccines cause or increase the risk of multiple sclerosis? This is likely the best publication ever done on this topic, and I'm going to review the article and give you my own opinion. My name is Brandon Bieber. I'm a neurologist and multiple sclerosis specialist. I have hundreds, if not over a thousand patients with MS, and I have in rare instances seen people with an onset of symptoms of MS shortly after COVID-19 infection or vaccination, and I've even submitted a few VAERS reports. I also have one patient who has MS and was stable for years and had a very significant attack with multiple gadolinium enhancing lesions or active lesions on MRI shortly after COVID-19 vaccination, and I did submit a VAERS report on this. And this basic science study found possible activation of CD4 positive T cells against myelin antigens, the target of inflammation in MS after COVID-19 vaccines, though this type of basic science doesn't necessarily correlate well with clinical outcomes historically. For example, some people speculated possible homology between epitopes of COVID-19 vaccines and the placenta, and there may be a risk of placentitis or infertility, and of course, this did not pan out. And as I pointed out in this tweet, MS existed long before COVID-19 infection and vaccination, and is not that rare of a disease. According to one source, the incidence or number of new diagnoses per year in the U.S. is 46.3 per 100,000, so the incidence per two weeks is 1.78 times 10 to the negative fifth, so with roughly 270 million Americans having been vaccinated with COVID-19 vaccines, I would expect around 4,800 people having an onset of MS symptoms within two weeks after COVID-19 vaccination just by random chance, much more than that if you allow a larger time window. So obviously people will get MS after COVID-19 infection and vaccination for the exact same reason they get MS after eating strawberries or watching Disney movies to find out if there's an actual association with vaccination or infection, you have to actually compare the rate of developing MS to the background rate or the rate in people who are unvaccinated or uninfected. And that is exactly what these authors did, and they dramatically increased their chance of capturing new diagnoses of MS by studying a group of people who have something called radiologically isolated syndrome, or RIS. These are people who have MRI features typical of MS, but do not have the disease because they do not meet the diagnostic criteria because they do not have symptoms. These are people who have an MRI for another reason, maybe head trauma or migraine, and they end up having lesions on MRI typical of MS, but they report no symptoms and have a normal neurological examination. But long-term, they have approximately a 50% risk of MS, depending on other features and the case series you look at. And so this represents an opportunity to capture people who are likely to have a new diagnosis of MS in the near future. So let's take a look at the article, and I've given credit to first author Mikhail Cohen and senior author Christine labrin Frenet. I also note that I know this author, Daniel Pelletier, who is a multiple sclerosis specialist at USC, where I trained as a fellow a long time ago, although he was not one of my mentors, he was not there yet. They give a little introduction about COVID-19 and multiple sclerosis, we'll skip to the methods section. And so this is a multi-center, in other words, at multiple centers that treat MS, observational study in people who had radiologically isolated syndrome from the French MS Society, and they had cohorts in three countries, France, the United States, and Turkey, and you can see the clinicaltrials.gov website here. They use the ACUDA criteria for radiologically isolated syndrome. And if you want more information on that, I have a separate video on RIS in the notes below. And they looked at a few outcomes. One was clinical conversion to multiple sclerosis. In other words, having a clinical event such as optic neuritis, pain and vision loss in one eye, or transverse myelitis, numbness or weakness in the extremities, leading to a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. Again, you need symptoms to have MS. The other thing they looked at was MRI, and they looked at evidence of disease activity on MRI. MRI, such as new or enlarging lesions on T2 sequences or gadolinium enhancing or contrast enhancing active lesions. And I'll skip over their statistical analysis, but it seems to be legitimate to me. Now, I'll look at the overview of the study. So they had 357 people who had IRS, although they didn't have data on vaccination records in 11, so they were excluded. And then they also had seven people who had incomplete vaccination. Maybe they only had one vaccine of a two vaccine series, so they were excluded. So there were really only 
339 people, 70 who were unvaccinated, and 269 who were vaccinated. So a moderate sample size here, not a huge sample size. Of course, the problem in a study like this is you may not get a huge number of people getting multiple sclerosis, so keep that in mind. This is the baseline characteristics of people in the study. Just look at the left column, the global population. There aren't really major imbalances here. 72.8% female which makes sense because multiple sclerosis is primarily a female disease. Average age, 38.4, 90% Caucasian, so maybe limited applicability to other ethnicities. Now, there are known risk factors for conversion from RIS to multiple sclerosis. If you have spinal cord lesions on MRI, you have an increased risk. 29.7% did. If you have an active lesion, you have increased risk. 15.2%, a relatively low proportion, did. If you have a brainstem or infratentorial lesion, you have an increased risk, 48%. If you have antibodies or oligoclonal bands in the cerebral spinal fluid, you have an increased risk, 63% did. I presume a lot of these people didn't have a spinal tap performed. And they also had 84 patients, or 27.8%, who had COVID-19 infection. 27 of those were completely vaccinated. So most people were unvaccinated, but some people were vaccinated and still got COVID-19. Now, the primary outcome was actually getting multiple sclerosis. The secondary outcome was essentially the MRI findings. So let's take a look at the result. So the first thing they looked at is they looked at the people who actually got multiple sclerosis. Now, 38 people in this study had a clinical event. In other words, they got multiple sclerosis prior to getting vaccinated. And so they were excluded. They already got multiple sclerosis. So you really only had 312 people left. The people who got a clinical event, in other words, got multiple sclerosis, it was 18 people or 6.7% of the vaccinated group versus six people or 8.5% of the unvaccinated group. So a slightly higher percentage, 8.5% who actually got MS, who were vaccinated, although these are relatively small numbers, six versus 18. But certainly there were not more people getting MS. There were, in fact, less people getting MS who were vaccinated. Obviously, this difference is not statistically significant. And they said the mean delay of the first clinical event after vaccination was 172 days, with the range being from five days to 427 days. Now, in general, the side effect of vaccines causing immune phenomena, such as Guillain-Barre syndrome after the flu vaccine, generally they tend to occur within one week to two months. So 427 days is a really long time to actually ascribe that event to the vaccination, but you never know. They were just looking at overall risk in the population. Now, if you look at MRI outcomes, uh, they didn't have MRI data on all of the subjects. But amongst the ones they did, they had disease activity in 22 people, in other words, new MRI lesions or active MRI lesions, or 13.6% in the vaccinated group versus only two, or 7.4% in the unvaccinated. So almost twice as many who were vaccinated had new or active MRI lesions. Remember, there were more people who were vaccinated, so look at the percentages, 13.6% versus 7.4%. But of course, these are small numbers, so there was no statistically significant difference. So to summarize, with COVID-19 vaccination, there were slightly more people getting multiple sclerosis who were vaccinated, but more people who had new MRI lesions, but they may not have had symptoms, who were vaccinated. So overall, there's really no clear association overall with multiple sclerosis disease activity and vaccination. What about COVID-19 infections? Now, amongst the 84 people with RIS who had a documented COVID-19 infection, conversion to MS already happened in 12 of those people. So they were excluded from the analysis. They already got MS before they even got infected. So obviously it doesn't count. So they analyzed the rest of those infections, which would be 72 infections. There was a first clinical event, in other words, getting clinical multiple sclerosis in eight people or 12.1% with a history of COVID-19 infection, 
versus 27 people or 13.5% without COVID-19 infection. So people who were infected were slightly less likely to get multiple sclerosis, but obviously not a statistically significant difference, roughly the same. So no difference there really. In terms of MRI, there seemed to be an imbalance. Where 62 out of 72 or 86.1% of people who got infected had an MRI versus only 54.5% who were not infected. So for whatever reason, people who got COVID-19 were more likely to get MRIs. They found evidence of disease activity, in other words, new T2 lesions or active lesions, in 16.1% of people who had COVID-19 infection versus only nine people or 7.6% in people who did not have infection. But again, this could be explained in the fact that the people who were infected seemed to be less likely to get MRIs in general, and it was not statistically significant. So overall, for people who had infection with COVID-19, there really is not a clear increased risk of multiple sclerosis or having new lesions on MRI. So listen, there are limitations to every study. We can't say anything about years down the line. Epstein-Barr virus seems to increase the risk of getting multiple sclerosis 10, 20 years later. Could COVID-19 vaccination or infection do the same thing? In theory, yes. Again, historically, that hasn't been true. Immune-mediated side effects of vaccinations or infections typically occur shortly after, for instance, yellow fever vaccine-associated neurological disease, on bray syndrome with the flu vaccine. They occur relatively shortly after vaccination, but no one can say 100%. Also, again, these are relatively small sample sizes. But is there an increased risk of multiple sclerosis or new MRI activity in people who have COVID-19 infection or vaccination? Probably not. Likely these cases are coincidental. I know it may sound hard to believe, but the reality is people just get neurological diseases like multiple sclerosis all the time, and they're not always associated with recent events. And overall, there's very, very strong evidence that the pathophysiologic onset of MS occurs years, if not decades, prior to the first symptoms. But I'd like to know, what are your thoughts on this study? What are your experiences with COVID-19 vaccination or infection? And do you have any suggestions for future videos?